all and I have bled. The memories you gave. What I'd like to do is talk about memories because I, I'd had a couple of articles uh, published in uh, Fortune Times relating to memories. And I, I, I also like to have a, a title for a presentation or, or an article which uses either a musical or literary link. And uh, memories are made of this seem to be perfect. And uh, by Perry Como. And I was, this is great. So uh, when uh, Janet and Paul asked me to give the talk, uh, what sprung to my mind was, can you please get Perry Como's um, memories are made of this? Um, because it always reminds me of my Auntie Joan, who was a huge Perry Como fan. Now, my Auntie Joan, she wasn't my real auntie. She was... Uh, she and my uncle Vin were my mum and dad's best friends. And uh, we'd be down at her house uh, regularly. And whenever there was something on the radio by Perry Como, or she'd be putting it on the, on the record player, and she'd be singing along to it. So every time I always think of Perry Como, uh, I, I always think of my Auntie Joan. And I thought, well, that, that's a good way of... Uh, Get, getting into the talk because it's something that so often music triggers memories of events or people and so on. So um, I, I asked Paul to get that, but then he came back to me and said, I, I can't find it. The only person I can find doing it is Dean Martin. So I thought, what a load of rubbish. You know, I'll find it. But when I checked, I realized that it was Dean Martin. Perry Como never recorded the song. And I'm thinking, what am I going to be daft? And what I've been thinking about was the track that, um, that, that CJ is about to play. Okay, CJ? Certainly. Oh, when two hearts are okay, CJ. It says at the bottom, magic moments explicit. That oh. boggles the mind. I'm not quite sure what's explicit about Perry Como, but... I've they... no idea. A great guy. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 I find Amazon's... Uh, yeah, they're... I'm not quite sure where they've said that. But anyway, let's get back but, to the talk. And... Yeah. But the thing was, was that I'd obviously in my mind taken... The, the song Magic Moments is... Uh, about memories, memories we've been sharing, and so yeah. on. Uh, and the, in my mind, because I'd seen my Auntie Joan singing that and I'd heard it a lot, I conflated the two. And I thought that memories are made of this are actu was actually by Perry Como, which in, in itself um, tends to highlight uh, the how fragile memories can be, even when you, I mean, I was adamant, absolutely adamant that um, Perry Como had sung it, but I was proved wrong. So, um, right, now, uh, the new slide, please. Next slide. Now, before we, we leave Dino, I, I, this, these are the lyrics to, um, Memories are made of this, and I, I, I should find I find some of these lyrics quite disturbing. Um, you know, three little kids for the flavor. Stir carefully through the days. See how the flavor stays. Now, there's a touch of Cronus devouring his children, perhaps here, or should we say, pedo cannibalism, possibly. But then, uh. Who knows? It's a bit spooky, the word, if you think about it. But uh, I should say that that is just a joke in case anybody who owns a copyright for the uh, the song uh, decides that they think they should sue me. OK. But what I'd like to highlight is that uh, memory is acknowledged to be imperfect. If you get six people witness a crime, then no doubt you'll get six different versions of what happened, and they would all be on oath. Of course, this might not be just down to variations in people's memories, but also variation in their positions, how they understood what they saw, 
and how they interpreted things. So each of the memories might be might all be accurate for each person, but they might all be different from one another in a number of ways. Next slide, please. Right. I'd like to stress that I'm not a psychologist or a biologist or a neurologist. So I'm just a lay person discussing, talking about memories. Um, I'm, I'm going to, the, the, the three main topics there, the Mandela effect, transient global amnesia, and cellular memory were what I talked about at Lapis. Uh, I, I've inserted weirdness at Weird Weekend Law 2022, and I'm not talking about Claire and CJ here, but there was a very strange event which took place which has got something to do with memory. So I thought I would kick off with that. So, um, yep, if you could do the next slide, please. All right, uh, that, that's me um, presenting to the audience there. And uh, my presentation, which is the first um, talk of the first day, uh, was about the Aintree Spectres which is a, a load of strange men dressed very much like the Ku Klux Klan, brandishing burning torches, marching around a field just outside Aintree Village uh, on Merseyside. And there's an article um, that, that I wrote about this in Fortune Times uh, in October 2020. But I, I had intended to talk about it at, at um, and give the presentation at We Weekend North, um, 2020, but unfortunately with COVID, um, it was a case of this was the very first time that I'd ever delivered it. Now, afterwards, uh, as soon as I'd finished, uh, a woman hurried over to me and asked why I had repeated it from an earlier weird weekend north, rather than delivering a new talk. Understandably, I was rather surprised. I explained that this was the very first time that I had ever given it, which perturbed her greatly. She told me she had seen me give the exact same presentation before, even down to the jokes and asides, which if anybody who's seen my uh, presentation knows, um, I, I sometimes struggle with my jokes and asides. Uh, but as we chatted later, she explained that she sometimes had similar inexplicable episodes, but was adamant about having seen my Aintree Spectre's talk before. Her daughter, who was with her, added that they had heard someone else say that they'd also seen me do the talk before and pointed him out. I went over to speak to the man who confirmed that he believed he'd also seen my talk in the past, although he described this memory as being more like a strong case of deja vu. At the lunchtime, when I was making an announcement about t-shirts, as you do, I asked if anyone else might have had a similar experience, and lo and behold, a third person um, came up to me on the afternoon and told me that he too had remembered seeing my complete presentation before. This is all very strange. I, I, I've never uh, delivered my entry spectre talk before, and yet three people said that they had. I asked them if they'd read my article in 14 times, but they, they were adamant that this had been no influence. So. Had there been some sort of time slip, or had maybe COVID-19 pandemic affected some people's memories up in some unknown way? Um, I found it very strange that, oh, striking that something so fortunate should actually take place at a fortune event. Okay, next slide, please. The Mandela effect. Man Nelson Mandela, President of South Africa. Next slide, please. Who apparently, oh, oh I don't go back a bit. That's it. Um, but many people apparently remember him dying in prison. Now, Fiona Broom um, has researched. Uh, ne next slide, please. 
Yeah, Fiona uh, Broom has researched and uh, written about paranormal phenomena since the early 1980s. She launched the Mandela Effect website in 2009 to discuss memories that didn't seem to match documented history. Um, Fiona herself had memories of Nelson Mandela dying in prison, hence the name. Many years ago, she was involved in conversation in the, in the annual Dragon Con's green room. I think it was possibly in Atlanta. And Dragon Con is arguably the largest multimedia pop culture convention focusing on science fiction and fantasy, gaming, comics, literature, art, music, and film, anywhere. As an aside, the security manager mentioned that, like her, other people remembered Ma Nelson Mandela's death in a South African prison years earlier. In reality, Mandela died in 2013. There were memories of his funeral in the late 20th century, with many people quoting nearly identical details of the coverage on American, Canadian, and British TV. No one could explain that coincidence. I would, as an aside, say, obviously, none of the people there were rugby union fans and seeing him actually present the... Uh, the World Cup to the world champion South Africa in 1995, wearing a South Africa Springbok shirt. Others in the green room then joined the conversation, which led to a discussion that spun into very weird tangents. One of the book editors then encouraged her to start a website about the Mandela effect to measure public interest in it. And within a couple of years, the topic had turned into something much bigger. Visitors to the website learned about others' memories where there were similar incorrect details and points of reference, including multiple unconnected people. She, spread, she stresses that this isn't a conspiracy and we're not talking about false memories as such. Um, some speculate that parallel alternate realities exist and we've been sliding between them without realizing it. There are different opinions and no one size fits all answer. But it, the website uh, address is there, mandelaeffect.com. And the topic has become fairly mainstream and has been included in the X-Files and even good housekeeping. But what is it? How did it come about? And what are the examples? Now, one that is quoted a lot is David Soul. Some people remember that David Soul of the 70s show, Starsky and Hutch, committed suicide on or near Christmas because he was despondent over his wife's cancer. Even news reports of relatives and police discovering his body underneath the Christmas tree. They were then shocked when they saw David Soul make an appearance as a cameo on the remake of Starsky and Hutch movie. They sat in silence and stunned by the revelation that Mr. Soul was indeed alive. Ernest Borgnine. Somebody saying, I remember Ernest Borgnine's death a while ago. At the time, I thought, wow, he had to be pretty old. I didn't know he was still around. Borgnine's death didn't surprise me until I later saw him interviewed on TV. And he was obviously still alive. Even in an issue of 14 Times in letters about Matrix glitches. A guy called Steve Small said in February 2012 that he knew that Sylvester Stallone had died of a heart attack in 2010. Now, you're going to have to forgive me here because what to me these examples illustrate is something that I think we all have done when we've been watching TV, maybe a an interview chat show or something like that and someone comes on the tv and you think i thought he was dead but they now some of the other examples that are quoted are uh, the number of states in the usa many people apparently many people recall the united states including 51 or 52 states and not 50. the interesting point is that the memories are fairly consistent and include puerto rico as a state which it isn't but that would still only make 51. Forrest Gump, question, does Forrest say, A, life was a box of chocolates, or B, 
life is like a box of chocolates. The answer in reality is A, life was like a box of chocolates. At Tiananmen Square, the tank boy. Was the Tiananmen Square tank boy run over and killed by the tank? Some people remember this as being the case, but he wasn't. Now, quite a few cases that are quoted on the Mandela Effect website, I consider to be more about people remembering things differently. Examples, was it Looney Tunes or Looney Tunes? And was it Jif or Jiffy Peanut Butter? To me, this is just people's memories being a bit different, often on small details. A good example is the Forrest Gump example. And I might include my Auntie Joan memory. And there can be no doubt that when newspapers publish something that is incorrect, then some people will remember the headline or whatever it is. For example, the Chicago Daily Tribune headline that Dewey had won the 1948 US presidential election when in fact Truman won. And I'm putting fake news to one side. But for me, and I hope I'm not being too cynical, it seems a bit like there are a few good cases, such as Nelson Mandela's alleged death in prison, which made everyone wonder if there was a phenomenon. But by naming the phenomenon and setting up a website to collect more examples, it strikes me that many cases are included which are not phenomenological at all. They are just people remembering things differently. And they are often topics that people would argue with us about. Did the evil queen in uh, Walt Disney's Snow White say, mirror, mirror on the wall? No, she didn't. She said, magic mirror on the wall. Therefore, I suggest that the phenomenon is more often down to people repeating misquotes with other people believing them and not checking the original sources. Therefore, it is not actually as big a phenomenon as some people might like to believe. And perish the thought that it's a means of maintaining a paranormal profile for Fiona Blue. Next slide, please. Okay. This is a, uh, an article that, or from an article that I wrote in 14 Times, uh, A Time to Remember. Sunday, 3rd of December, 2006. A date to remember, because it's a day I'd lost my memory. At the time, I was undergoing significant stress. Two sons were buying houses in Yorkshire, I was writing up my PhD. My mum was unwell, which meant 150 miles round trip. And as a management consultant, I was balancing various projects where you are only as good as your last job. My son in York needed a bike to ride to hospital for his work. And rather than risking his expensive mountain bike, I decided he could have my old sit up and beg. I checked it in the garage and both tires were flat. So I started to pump them up. One was okay, but the other did not inflate. So I adopted the method of checking it to the flat tire from my youth, i.e. vigorously pump it up. And if it starts to inflate and then deflate, you've got a slow puncture, which can be easily mended. If there's no inflation at all, then the tire is beyond repair. I made a couple of energetic attempts to inflate the said tire bent over in rather cramped conditions, but it was no good. So I tidied up and went inside the house to where my wife Margaret was in the kitchen, and I began to wash my hands. Please can you get a new inner tube when you go past the bike shop next, I asked her. She agreed and began making a note in the diary. Oh, she asked, what size inner tube do you need? Why are you asking about an inner tube, I replied because you just asked me to buy one, because one of the ones you've been pumping up in the garage has a hole in it. In that split second, my memory had gone. I could not remember discussing the purchase of the inner tube second previously, nor having been in the garage. Margaret showed me the Sunday paper. I recognized it and I, and I asked how it had got there. 
She replied that I'd been to the shops and bought it myself. I couldn't remember doing it all, doing this at all. Naturally, Margaret was starting to get worried. And she asked me if I remembered going to see a Gino Washington concert with friends two days before. I had absolutely no recollection. And let's face it, you don't forget quickly a Gino Washington. Fearing that I'd had a minor stroke, Margaret sat me down and went to get her coats to take me to the hospital. During what could have only been a minute, I must have momentarily dozed off because I thought that both my sons who lived in Yorkshire had come to visit me. When Margaret returned, I realized that I must have dreamed or, or imagined their visit and got ready to go to the hospital. To cut a long story short, I underwent a series of tests over a number of hours, which determined that there was nothing wrong with me. During this time, my memory slowly started to return, and in the end, I just wanted to go home. A few days later, I returned to hospital and underwent a brain scan. And much to Margaret's surprise, they found that I did have one. Everything was fine, and the consultant advised me that I had experienced transient global amnesia. TGA, which he described as likely to be some fatty substance temporarily blocking connections in my brain and then dispersing. I was unlikely to experience it again, and I have. The diagnostic criteria for TGA include the attack was witnessed by a capable observer and reported as being a definite loss of recent memory retrograde amnesia. There was an absence of clouding of consciousness or other cognitive impairments other than amnesia. There were no focal neurological signs or deficits during or after the attack. There were no features of epilepsy or active epilepsy in the past two years, and the patient did not have any recent head injury. The attack resolved within 24 hours. All of these applied to me. But if Margaret had not been present, I would simply not have remembered what I had done and might have attributed this to a loss of time. Had I been alone in familiar surroundings, I might have carried on my mundane activities without realizing any memory loss had occurred. But if someone was alone and traveling, particularly at night, then experience of TGA would inevitably cause them confusion. My experience and my point is that it happens in an instant. You do not remember anything for a given period before, despite being completely compass mentis. Now, a stereotypical event in ufology has someone driving through the countryside at night when their car enters a luminous cloud or similar, and then the driver finds him or herself miles further down the road and a half an hour has gone missing. All of the above di diagnostic criteria can be applied to such a situation, except the involvement of an independent witness. Subsequently under hypnosis, they remember that they were abducted by aliens and taken aboard a spaceship for a variety of adventures, but some commentators argue that many perceived UFOs are forms of rare meteorological phenomena. Therefore, my, and I stress, speculative interpretation of these events is that they do involve rare meteorological phenomena. And these phenomena can induce TGA in humans who get too close to them. Any buildings and cars that are passed during the lost period of the journey are simply forgotten. How this impact actually occurs is open to debate, but if such phenomena have an electrical element and can cause pressure or physical effects, then it is not unreasonable to assume that they can influence an individual's neurological circuits on a temporary basis. It would follow that if more than one person gets too close, then the phenomena can have the same or a similar effect on all of them. Estimates of the annual incidence of TGA vary between 2.9 cases per 100,000 population in Spain to 5.2 in the USA. But are such 
but they are much greater among people aged over 50. So CJ, watch out. Therefore, TGA is not uncommon and unsurprisingly, people affected by it seek an explanation. Most will be seen and treated by doctors who accept the TGA diagnosis and be reassured that it is unlikely to happen again. However, those who do not see a doctor, and some of those who do, may interpret the episode within their own worldview or that of people they discuss the episode with. Alien abductions are pretty ubiquitous in fiction and faction through films, television, books, and other media, and will inevitably be included in some interpretations of events, consciously or subconsciously, by either the subject or the interrogator. Clearly, I had a TGA episode, but if my wife had not been present and I had not gone to hospital, I might have believed that somehow my eldest two sons had teleported from Yorkshire to Merseyside for a short visit. I conclude that whilst clocks measure time, a person's perception of time depends upon their memory to some extent. I surmise that most, if not all, reported episodes of lost time are not lost time, but lost memory and suggest that there are rare meteorological phenomena that can induce memory loss on a temporary basis. Next slide, please. Cellular memory. Um, again, this is a covered by the 14 Times article of mine called Thanks to the Memories. Um, and there's a question, what is? cellular memory uh, and then i'll talk about uh, experiments of dr james v mcconnell at the university of michigan alan moore's swamp thing and then i'll read i'll read out uh, some real life examples which are suggestive of cellular memory but what what is it uh, in essence the theory is that memory does not sit only in the brain as most materialists would argue but somehow permeates the whole body. Um, the, the cases might remind uh, people of the, the film Heart Condition, in which Bob Hoskins plays a bigoted white cop who receives the heart of a murdered black cop, Denzel Washington. Hoskins goes down to put the killer in jail and confront his own prejudices with help from Washington's ghost. But there is also, if you go back, Maurice Reynard's uh, novel of 1920, The Hands of Orlac, uh, which has been filmed many times, probably most famously in Mad Love, starring Peter, Peter Lorre. Uh, I'd watch any film with Peter Lorre in it, I must confess. Um, in this, he is the Stephen Orlac, a famous concert pianist whose hands are horribly mutilated in a train accident. A surgeon drafts on a new pair of hands and Orlac finds himself possessed by strange and terrible impulses. He discovers that the hands were those of a man guillotined for murder, and the spirit of the dead man has survived to live again in the tormented pianist. Okay, so that's what cellular memory is supposedly about, that it can affect people and that somehow it, through transplants and so on, it can uh, influence, uh, well, the donors can influence the recipients. But I'm now going to talk about uh, Dr. James McConnell. Next slide, please. Okay, that's him on the left. Um, scientists have actually researched the phenomenon. Towards the end of the 1950s, Dr. James McConnell performed a series of experiments at the University of Michigan, where he was seeking to demonstrate that memories could be stored in cells outside the brain. Um, what this, his research involved was common freshwater flatworms, I'm gonna try and pronounce this, Dujasia dorotokephala, I hope I pronounced that correctly, which like mammals and unlike creatures such as jellyfish, have a centralized brain but they can regenerate themselves from tiny morsels of flesh. If you sever a flatworm's tail, within 14 days, you will have an entirely new specimen, fully equipped with a brand new brain. 
Flat ones can also be trained to remember a behavior and perform it on cue. For example, electrical shocks can be used to teach them to respond to writing cues by moving to a particular part of a Petri dish. So what did McConnell have in common with the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland? Next slide, it's off with their heads. McConnell found that flatworms could recall their training after their heads were cut off and their brains grew anew, arguably showing that memories could live outside the brain. His work was published in academic journals. He stated that the tail regenerates and showed as good a memory of the original task as did the heads. As a result, he became very famous and appeared on TV programs such as the Steve Allen Show, using his charismatic personality to dazzle audiences. I must confess that he didn't look that charismatic on the previous slide, but there you go. He hypothesized that ribonucleic acid, RNA, could enable long-term memories to be stored outside the brain, since RNA encodes information and since living cells can produce and modify RNA in reaction to external events. It might also be used in neurons to record stimuli. To test this, McConnell fed ground up bits of trained flatworms to, his untra to their untrained brethren. So it's referred to as the cannibalism experiment. He claimed that to find, so he claimed to find that the untrained flatworms performed behavior previously learned by the trained flatworms, i.e. the dead flatworms memories had transferred to the untrained flatworms. Other universities sought to replicate this research with the majority not finding the same results and criticizing McConnell for his small sample size. Heated academic arguments ensued. Ultimately, McConnell's work was cast aside, considered to be a failure. Perhaps an example of Charles Fort's observation that things in science are nothing more than the proper thing to wear for a while. Yet science cannot offer conclusive evidence about how exactly memories are stored. <clears throat> Researchers are unlikely to go further than saying information is stored in the brain's neural networks in the connections that enable the transmission of information from one neuron to the next. There is no specific answer to the question of how memories are encoded or and decoded in the brain. Some researchers prefer to focus on the sorts of modifications taking place in the brain when memory is stored, such as changes in neuron structure. So they might reverse engineer memory formation, but this is not the same as establishing how memory is encoded or where it is stored. In 2013, a paper by Shomrath and Levin reopened the debate. Levin, a developmental biologist well-known for his work on limb regeneration, repeated McConnell's first memory experiment as a side project, utilizing the same basic principles. Organisms without a brain to begin with can learn. Even sperm can learn to run mazes. Don't ask me. Anyway, maybe McConnell was partially right. Levin's fully automated process, minimizing human participation, appeared to bear out McConnell's findings. Levin's transparency with his data has helped, but he is yet to determine the mechanism behind his findings. If Levin's work is reproducible and does ultimately gain acceptance, then might McConnell's reputation be revised to that of a pioneer? I suspect that McConnell was onto something with his initial experiments, but that his cannibalism um, was a bridge too far. The most obvious difference between the two is that the former involved flatworms that were that continue to live after their heads are removed, while the latter involved evolve flatworms that were dead and very mashed up. 
I guess that his hubris, celebrity, and perhaps self-delusion caused him to publicize the results nevertheless. This brings me back to the cellular memory examples that I quoted earlier, and those that I will quote later. All involved living organs, even though some donors may have been technically dead. This means that there is more in common with Levin's and McConnell's first memory experiments than nothing in common with McConnell's later memory experiments. Levin, therefore, could at least be pointing in the direction of where an explanation for the phenomenon will be found. But I suspect that this will be many, many years in the future. Now, a thought. In some future sci-fi universe, where brain transplants have become commonplace, is the brain being donated to the recipient or is the body of the recipient being donated to the brain? And will the brain donor's memories become those of the recipient with none of the recipient's memories retained? Next slide, please. Alan Moore, uh, one of my favorite uh, authors, Swamp Thing. Now, uh, he, Alan Moore actually used cellular memory as a device in the Saga of Swamp Thing, uh, episode 21. And although McConnell's work was trashed by scientists, it remained to some degree in the public consciousness. And this is an excellent example of where Alan used it. Uh, and in it, what's believing the protagonist scientist, Alec Holland, to be dead, an autopsy on the swamp thing establishes that Alec did not turn into a plant mutant. In fact, the swamp vegetation had digested his mortal remains. It had absorbed his mind, his memories, his knowledge and his skills to create a new sentient being which believed itself to be Alec Holland. Uh, that's great device, great thinking. But uh, it, it, it highlights some of the thought patterns that you need to be getting your head around with uh, cellular memory. Next slide, please. Right, I'm, I'm now going to read you some real life examples which are suggestive of cellular memory. Some of them, a, a book with uh, several in, um, which to a large degree focuses on heart transplants, but not exclusively, is Paul Pearsall's The Heart's Code. And it, it is a very interesting read, but I will include some others. Um, the, the first, I think, three or four that are from, from the heart's code. All right. Um, the, the heading here is the heart that found its body's killer. Uh, Pearsall was speaking to an international group of psychologists, psychiatrists, and social workers meeting in Houston in Texas. He spoke to them about his ideas about the central role of the heart in uh, psychological and spiritual life. And following his presentation, a psychiatrist came to the microphone during the question and answer session to ask him about one of her patients whose experience seemed to substantiate his ideas about cellular memories and the thinking heart. The case dis disturbed her so much that she struggled to speak through her tears. Sobbing to the point that the audience and Pearson had difficulty understanding her, she said, I have a patient, an eight-year-old little girl who received the heart of a murdered 10-year-old girl. Her mother brought her to me when she started screaming at night about her dreams of the man who had murdered the donor. She said that her daughter knew who it was. After several sessions, I just could not deny the reality of what this child was telling me. Her mother and I finally decided to call the police and using the descriptions from the little girl, they found the murderer. He was easily convicted with evidence by, that my patient provided. The time, the weapon, the place, 
the clothes he wore, what the little girl he killed had said to him. Everything the little heart transplant recipient reported was completely accurate. Quite a mind bug on that. So, <clears throat> a second one. Now this is a, a 52 year old male heart transplant recipient with a donor, a 17 year old boy killed by a hit and run driver. It's two years after my transplant, I still feel sorry for my old heart. It just comes over me sometimes when I least expect it. It served me well and it, and it died so I could live. Sometimes I wish I could have seen it one more time and I wonder what happened to it. But I hate thinking about that for too long. Well, that's hard to deal with. Um, I could never understand it. I loved quiet classical music before my new heart. Now I put on earphones, crank up the stereo and play loud rock and roll music. I love my wife. I keep fantasizing about teenage girls. My daughter says I've regressed since my new heart and that I act like a 16 year old. The daughter says it's really embarrassing sometimes. When my friends come over, they ask if my dad is going through his second childhood. He's addicted to loud music and my mom says the little boy in him is finally coming out. Next one is a 47 year old female heart trans transplant recipient and the donor, a 23, 23 year old gay man shot to death in a robbery and died from severe wound to lower back. For three years, I never told anyone about this. It still bothers me. I met the family of my donor and they said, that their son was a bright young artist and that he was gay. Now I wonder if, when I look at my husband, I, I, I am looking at him like a woman would look at him, like I used to do, or if I'm looking at him like a young gay man would look at him. I'm glad I can finally talk to you about this. And one more thing, his mother said they shot him in the back. After my surgery, I've had shooting pains in my lower back, but I guess that's just the surgery acting up. Her husband says, I was surprised when one of the first things X asked me when we started having sex again after her surgery was whether or not I ever had gay fantasies. She was completely changed how she dresses now. She wears very feminine and revealing clothes where before she wore unisex clothes. Sometimes during the night she will awake suddenly and scream. I used to think she was having a heart attack, but she would point to her back and say it was like a shooting pain right in the middle of her back. Right. This next one is a 35 year old female heart transplant recipient, the donor, a 24 year old prostitute killed in a stabbing. I never really was that interested in sex. I never really thought about it much. Don't get me wrong, my husband and I had a sex life, but it was not a big part of our life. Now I tire my husband out. I want sex every night and I masturbate two or three times a day sometimes. I used to hate X-rated videos, but now I love them. I feel like a slut sometimes and I even do a strip for my husband when I'm in the mood. I would never have done that before my surgery. When I told my psychiatrist about this, she said it was a reaction to my medications and my healthy body. Then I found out that my donor was a young college girl who worked as a topless dancer and in a call, an outcall service. I think I've got her sexual drive and my husband agrees. He says I'm not the woman he married, but he wants to marry me again. The husband said, not that I'm complaining, mind you, but what I have now is a sex kitten. It's not that we do it more, but she wants to talk about sex more and wants to see sexually explicit tapes, which I could never talk to her into before. When we do have sex, it's different. Not worse or better, just different. She never talks much during sex, but now she, she never talks much during sex, but now she practically narrates the whole thing. She uses words I never heard her use before, but it kind of turns me on, so who's complaining? Our worst argument came a few months after her transplant and well before she knew who her donor was. I was joking as a, as a passionate moment said that she must have gotten the heart of a whore. We didn't talk for weeks. Okay. 
I'm now moving on to just a few others to uh, finish as examples, which are, uh, are from other sources. Um, echoes of all up is the headline here. There is some intriguing contentious anecdotal evidence that organ transplants can lead to behavior modification. When Claire Sylvia, a 47 year old dance teacher from Queens, New York, woke up from a heart and lung transplant operation at Yale New Haven Hospital in 1988, she found she was craving new strange things, beer, green peppers and chicken nuggets. Green became her favorite color supplanting red and she caught herself owning women like a man. She began dreaming about a young man called Tim L. In one dream, she kissed him, sucking his body into her own. Quite convinced that her new organs were responsible for the mystifying changes, she set out to discover the identity of her donor. Although it was against official policy to divulge the information, one nurse let slip that the donor was an 18 year old boy from Maine who'd been killed in a motorcycle accident. Miss Sylvia found the death notice of Tim Lamarande, an 18 year old killed in Maine, and the hospital eventually admitted that he was her donor. She met the young man's family and discovered that he loved fried chicken and beer, and his favorite color had been green. He'd been carrying a packet of nuggets when he crashed into a tree without a helmet. Jane Lindley, 55 from Retford, Nottinghamshire, had a liver transplant in 1999 after developing hepatitis C and was suddenly a football fan. Her donor was a young married man from West Yorkshire. When football used to come on the television, it would be turned off or Jane would disappear and read a book elsewhere, said her husband, Cyril, a lifelong Leeds United supporter. Now, she's as big a fan as I am, even to the point where she's putting on teletext, sorry, this is 1999, um, to catch up with the latest results. Said Jane, it's all very strange. I'm finding I'm thinking about Leeds United more and more. I know all the players' names and understand the game. It's just great. The last example, which is my favorite, a lumberjack claimed he started enjoying housework after he was given a female kidney and sued his health authority. Stepan Lizacic, 56, from the East Croatian town of Ozijek, said he be had become a laughing stock because he no longer wanted to go drinking with his friends. The transplant saved my life, he said, but I wasn't warned about the side effect. I have developed a strange passion for ironing, sewing, washing dishes, sorting clothes in wardrobes, and even knitting. His wife, Rad Miller, added, if it is just housework, I'm happy. I only hope he doesn't start looking at other men. Next slide, please. Right, what are memories and where did they reside? As I said, there's lots of evidence that things are complicated. And uh, for me, only the dogma most dogmatic can insist that memories only sit in the brain. Um, I, I think that from the cases and the examples that I've quoted, there can be little doubt that there is some phenomenon at play. Personally, I am persuaded that cellular memory is a phenomenon that shows that memory is not centered in the brain, but how and by what mechanism, I cannot say. Therefore, I recommend a fortune approach of keeping an open mind and accumulating data until science is in a better place to investigate. Many of the examples have involved donated hearts, lungs, kidneys, and livers. None of you will be aware that I'm a blood donor, 73 donations to date. Therefore, there are lots of people with my donated cells flowing through their veins. No doubt blood donation would be the weakest form of cellular memory, but I just wonder if maybe I might be gently influencing the recipients of my blood 
to become a little more interested in weird stuff. And the final answer, next slide please. Oh, oh, I forgot to put that slide in. Boom, boom. Next Hang slide. Hang on, there might be, might be another one. Final slide. Questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for a fascinating talk. I think we all enjoyed that. Thank you very much. And yeah. uh, I'm just going to hand over to Caroline, who likes to do the questions if she wants to. What Otherwise, I'll run through them. Caroline, are you here? I am here, yep. Yeah. I mean, you can actually knock the slide off if you want. I mean, uh, it's Shall just I, just the last slide I showed you. Or are you going to do them tonight? I didn't hear that. Sorry. Do you want me to run through the questions or are you going to do them? No, no, I'm, I'm happy to do them. Thank you. It's fine. Okay. I, will I hope I can answer them. <laughs> so just before we start on the questions, I've got a quick thing. Remember, we started off with Dean Martin and Perry Como. Memories are made of this is indeed by Dean Martin. And I thought, okay, I'm going to check Rob. I'm going to check Rob's claim that he never recorded, Perry Como never recorded it. And Perry Como never did record it. But in 1981, he released an album, a compilation album, Perry Como, called Memories Are Made of Hits. <laughs> now, that is actually, I wondered why. So I looked it up, and it's because so many people thought he'd, he'd done memories are made of this that he actually released an album with the title memories are made of hits yeah as a reference to it but yeah. the song is not included on that album right so there you go maybe yeah. that is the song i wasn't aware of that this is what i was doing while, while i was listening to you i was carefully trying to research the perry como mystery and that was what i found i'll send you a copy of the album cover over later thank you Right, Caroline, do you want to go back and start at the beginning? Yep, definitely. Um, the first question or comment that we have um, is Ian Rowley. He says, Aintree Spectres, is it possible that you had an article published on this topic prior to the talk? I think um, that was in relation to people saying that they'd heard the talk before at the Weird, weird Weekend. Yes, the, the, the article was published before uh, I gave the talk. But I did specifically ask the people if they had read it, if they were familiar with it, but it influenced them and they said not. I was at the talk and I didn't have the impression I'd heard it before. And I had read the article years before or a year before, I think. So I thought, no, was it 20 you published the article and it was 22? Yeah, 2020. Yeah. yeah. And it was very different. In fact, I was making bad jokes, as I recall. But yeah, it was it was an excellent presentation. Perhaps you'd like to come back and do that one for us. I can do if you want, yeah. You haven't been murdered by the lily white boys yet, so I'm guessing <laughs> that's it. It's quite an eerie story, that one, though, isn't it? Oh, it's, uh, I still can't explain it. No, I, I've got no idea at all about that one. So let's uh, move on. Caroline. Um, the next comment was from me. It was about the parallel sliding universe swapping. Um, if it does, can I be thin and rich on the other one, please? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to answer that on the grounds it might include him. <laughs> um, right, I'm just going down. Um, there's a comment that there was a grey um, box at the bottom of the screen that was obscuring a lot, and um, somebody yeah. suggested it could be CJ's grey matter that had slipped. <laughs> I couldn't see it. I'm sorry. Could anyone else see it? Yeah, uh, it was, I did try uh, to remove it. I couldn't remove it, unfortunately. I'm sorry, I didn't know what it was. Um, <laughs> if it affected anybody's enjoyment of this. Evening. I think it was just the bottom of the slides. Actually, I don't think there was any. If I could have got rid of it, I would have done. But as I couldn't see it, it wasn't on my screen, so I have no idea at all what it was. Um, Christian Lander said, "Svalbard, I saw popped up with the tag of Mandela effect and thought it was relatively tiny island." turns out that it was bigger than Iceland. So I, I guess that was about the, the grey strip as well, I'm guessing. Oh, wow. Yeah, it, it was quite um, quite large for those who did see it. But um, right, um, TDA, with the memory loss and the missing time, I, I understand that, but would TGA include false memories as well, Rob? Would what involve, could you speak what, that? When you have TGA, so... Um, oh, sorry, TGA, yeah, yeah. Um, the memory loss, obviously, is um, from the fatty deposits within the brain, yeah. as you said. But 
as well as missing time, would you get false memories with that? Um, possibly, because I mean, I, I stress that I have no professional uh, insight. Um, but I, I made the point that when uh, Margaret went to get our coats to get us ready, uh, I must have dozed off for a second or two, uh, maybe a minute. And I was convinced that my two sons had come from Yorkshire to visit me. Now, obviously, that was wholly inaccurate. But uh, I, I, I can imagine that people might have um, similar, you know, uh, random thoughts or um, dreams or, or, or what have you that uh, they might then believe are reality. Yeah. It, it's difficult. Yeah. It's interesting hearing your concept of your own personal experience, because if you had the idea that your sons were present and they visited, then maybe that could be an explanation to missing time and UFO. Yeah, well, well I, I think one of the things is, is that the way that, um, and again, I don't claim to be an expert, on, a lot of these um, claims about of abductions and so on is, has been done under hypnosis and regression and so on. And I, I can see that people might have missing time in the, you know, driving through the desert and they go through a luminous cloud and then suddenly it's an hour later and they can't remember anything. Uh, the, the, the danger with the situation is, is that obviously they're confused, they're, they'll be looking for answers and then they, they get seen by a psychiatrist or a psychologist and it might, if they are inclined that way, they, they might um, deliberately or inadvertently plant suggestions about um, maybe they've been abducted or maybe because they've then gone and seen a TV programme or talked to friends who said, well, maybe you were abducted. It, it can influence it, it. It's very difficult to, it, each case is individual and, you know, who knows without the close inspection of an individual case, all you can do is try and uh, stand back, get as much data as possible and see if there are any patterns. Um, still on the TGA, Cameron Stark says, Dwayne Doc Graveline, an unflown NASA astronaut, experienced transient global amnesia long after he left NASA. He blamed it on the statins that he was taking, but the evidence appears to be weak with that one. Well, it's a bit ironic because after that, I was prescribed statins. <laughs> uh, <coughs> yeah, I mean, um, but the, the consultant said, you go see your GP and because my family have always had high uh, cholesterol. Um, they put me on statins, but I wasn't on it at the time. No. Um, Eric Lewis says that extreme trauma can cause loss of memory as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now I think we're moving on to the mem cell memory. So um, Bill Air says, question. Um, Bill, did you want to unmute yourself and ask the question yourself? Do you want me to read it and then you can chat? Um, you got it? Was it my question you were thinking of? Yes. Um, yes, um, it, it seems to me that nature is usually pretty uh, efficient um, for, and sensible. For example, we've got two eyes, so if we lose the sight in one, we can still see. We've got two ears, if we lose the hearing in one, we still hear with the other ear. This all seems a very efficient way of doing things. Don't you think that it would be remarkably inefficient for memory to be saved millions of times in the body in the millions of cells? You know, isn't it an extremely wasteful duplication? Um, I, I, I can't answer it um, in that sense. I, I don't know how. I, I've, I, I remember many, many, many years ago reading a, an article by Rupert Sheldrake, 
where he said, you can see it see, on a TV, there's a safe throwing set, a football match going on, and you're watching it. The football match isn't actually happening there in front of you. It's happening at Wembley Stadium or wherever it is. And, it's been, and he suggested that it might be that none of us are actually here in our bodies. You know, we are somewhere. It's, this is all before the Matrix, can I stress? But uh, that, that we are somewhere, maybe somewhere for, elsewhere, and that we kind of lock in to our bodies in some way. Um, and I, and I thought that's a completely different way of thinking about things because at the, at the moment, we, no, nobody thinks anything of uploading data, uh, storage files to the cloud. Um, whereas your backup storage versus your, your brain, which might be the equivalent of the uh, central processing unit, uh, it, how these things can actually interact, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, what I just do, my, my attitude is, I just find it all very fascinating. Um, and I don't think you, anybody can deny that there is a phenomenon. And how do you exp how do you explain it? You know, um, sending a memory with anything that is an unknown phenomenon, if you give it a label, it can skew people's understanding or perceptions of the phenomenon. If they called it something else, it might have been you know, different. I mean, I don't assume that um, all your memories are in each individual cell. But I, but I just don't know. I, I, I probably have got a Nobel Prize or something if I actually understood it. Yeah, in fact, what you've just explained with the Sheldrake uh, concept sort of takes me on to the next question I've got, which is that uh, don't you think it's possible that memory is in the mind? Now, I think Sheldrake's implying that our minds are separate from our bodies and brains. Yeah. And um, maybe the memories are in the mind rather than the brain or in addition to the brain. Yeah. I think it's sim similar to perhaps Sheldrake's thinking. Yeah, I, I, I think it, it, that, that could make sense. Um, given, given that there's evidence from mediumship, even if it's a bit controversial, that spirits have memories of their earth lives. Um, if the memory was only in the brain, then obviously they couldn't because the brain gets burnt up in the crematorium. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Um, obviously you've got um, my training that I've, I've done in sports therapy. So my knowledge of um, cells and the body um, would argue that they all cells have a memory. Um, and what I wrote here is, it's shown within the regeneration of each cell, which is done on a regular basis. Otherwise, how would a heart cell know that it's a heart cell or a skin cell take on that job? If they didn't have a memory, then the job of that cell would be nondescript and we wouldn't really function very well. So you've got the cellular memory that comes into that, but you also have um, muscle memory. And if you have an injury, the brain still acts as if it's got an injury. Um, and that works from the memory of the injury itself that was deep within that area. So I think there's a connection between each of the areas. So the muscle fibers, the bundles, the Golgi receptors, all the things that would give the brain the stimuli. Yeah. But when, uh, when I finished my talk at Lapis Conference, uh, and I was going to a seat, one of the uh, audience so I collared me, he made a very interesting point, which I forgot to mention, but it's, it's worth it. He said he wondered whether there might be some link to phantom limb syndrome, mm. where people have uh, lost, lost their leg or something. Pain. Yeah. But they still feel, feel it. And I, I thought that was an interesting you know, uh, take. Impossible extension of what I've talked about. 
although it's just a thought, I, I haven't had a chance to look into it, but it, it is obviously a relevant uh, yeah. possibility. I mean, there's different systems within the body. I don't want to go too in depth, but obviously you've got the system that you would be conscious of and that you're aware of. And then you've got the autonomic system, which does all the things that you don't even think about. So the breathing, the swallowing, you know, and the heart rate and the blood flow. Yeah. Um, and they they seem to be linked and um, driven by a nerve called the vagus nerve, which is attached to the brain. So when you get people with um, dementia, obviously the damage to the brain takes over, but the autonomic system still keeps working because of the memory. Yeah, although Parkinson's going to impact on mm. uh, on the autonomic. I mean, my father had Parkinson's and it stopped him swallowing at one point. Yeah. So, yeah. So obviously that's a different part of the brain that's affected by yeah, yeah. the disease. <clears throat> I mean, it, I'm, I'm not the expert when it comes to brain. Um, my partner, he's more of the expert because he's a psychotherapist. So I find a lot of stuff out from him to fill <laughs> the gaps in. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting theory there, isn't it? Yeah. With that. Um, moving on down the line, Christian Lander said, considering a number of transplants use pig organs, I wonder how those people are now and are they rolling in mud? Oh. Well, nice if it makes Christian happy, it might explain why um, I am the way I am, because in here I've had um, a bone little bit of a bone transplant and it was uh, synthetic and apparently from a pig so um yeah it might explain why i wash less than i used to <laughs> maybe you should rub on some ointments <laughs> 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 sorry i'll let you get away with that dad joke <laughs> <laughs> um so i think bill asked his second question um edward said send your memory was part of the sci-fi story who goes there which was made into the film the thing ed is that the one with the hand is he still here i am here the thing with the one with the hand that was the thing was it the hand no that was the one with john carpenter's one when they, they dug it up out of the ice in the antarctic and it um it, it was one tiny particle of it was enough to go infected with it it could it took you over and turned you into it basically absorbed oh. you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but it was yeah, they, they, they that's what they did they did a test a blood test as they worked out that because all of the cells are basically part of the same organism that they, they all each of the each individual cell would react um like like, an, like if the organism it's the entire organism would be attacked so they, they did um they had uh, kurt russell he had all these petri dishes and he took a blood sample from each person and he tested it with a hot wire to see what would happen so he figured that if it was if it was just normal human blood, it wouldn't react at all. But if I, it was I if it was that. the alien blood, it'd react like it would hit the alien with hot wire, and it just it shot out of the um, the petri dish. Mm. It was a very very, very scary film. <laughs> Were they based in an ice area somewhere? Yeah, the Antarctic. Yeah, I, I think I've seen that one. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I think it's cool. one of those films that's going to have its effect still, isn't it? Really. It does. Yeah, very yeah. much so. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Tony Hayes said, uh, and I thought this at the time when the music was played, Perry Como does sound a lot like Dean Martin. Had I've heard the song, I would have also presumed it was Perry Como, which is what Tony Hayes has said. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, it was the age of the crooner, wasn't it? Yeah. It did take me back. Uh, I think the last. I, I, I thought that would have been before you were born. No, I think the last one was a false memory because I've linked it to a Christmas advert, I think. Oh, probably. <laughs> Magic Moments, was it? And it was about um, giving people a Christmas present of chocolate or something. No, oh, probably. But there's your memories coming in again, isn't it? <laughs> so we've got a lot of um, thank yous. Dave Sivia, really interesting. Thank you. Carol Tierney, thank you for a fascinating talk. Really enjoyed it. Ian Rowley, right. Elizabeth Loftus did a lot of work into eyewitness testimony in court cases. She found eyewitnesses, um, I think that's confidence in their recollection, and they didn't match the accuracy of their testimony. Uh, I, I, well, that was one of the points that I made earlier on uh, at the beginning, and that we, we people can be quite honest, you know, and believing in them, what they've seen, but. Uh, 
a lot depends upon how how they interpret what they see. Yeah, I mean, um, as a as a previous police officer, we were told that in a scenario of extreme um, danger, for example, or or something that was um, an incident that we would all take part in, you would have what they would call red mist and your red mist would come up. So anything on the peripheral, anything that wasn't in your direct line of sight for maintaining your um, safety mm. became a blur. So um, somebody might be facing one way and in, intent on looking on the perpetrator and another person might be mm. um, trying to pick up um, the victim off the floor. So everybody's gonna have a different value of what they yeah pertain to be the important thing at that time. Everything that I've read about memories is that every time you bring back a memory, you, you alter it slightly, not intentionally, and, and then by repeating it eventually over time, it, it, it can, memories can evolve. And, yeah. you believe it, and you believe that it's still the same original memory that you had the first time, but apparently it isn't necessarily. But is it under, is it, memory changing or is it your memory is releasing more of the information um and when you go undergo post-traumatic stress treatment you you live that moment and you're living that moment for the first time you're just concentrating on that moment and then the next time you go back for a relive and you're listening to that first scenario that you have described there's lots more things that pop in and yeah, yeah. the evidence gets clearer. So first of all, you might not have noticed a light on in the building. And mm. then the next time you might not realize that you had keys in your hand. Um, so is it a case that your memory is just revealing more to you as time goes by because you've gotten used to that scenario? Uh, I, I think it, it depends on the circumstances. Sometimes exactly what you're saying is correct. But at other times, um, you know, over time, certain over years, um, your, your memories do mm. evolve, to, not only marginally, um, but you, you believe them to be accurate. Um, you know, but, but where's the proof? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Jackie, did you want to unmute yourself and ask your question about when you were a mental health team? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I was in a mental health team once, and this client um, ran out in panic. And she'd been talking to a therapist who suddenly looked at her blankly and said, "What am I doing? And what am I here for?" And basically, <laughs> she'd had um, one of the transamnemic nemic attacks, and basically, and didn't know what was happening. And the client was thought she'd had a stroke and was like trying to get her help, but obviously was really thrown and she was fine. And they said that was the same thing. They said probably stress induced, but yeah, oh. but it was a bit of a shock for the per client. <laughs> well, that, yeah, I, I, I didn't uh, run out naked, I can assure you. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, CJ will probably know better than me, but TIAs, trans in, in ischemic attacks, are they not small strokes in the brain? That would have a, a yeah, Kieran's nodding. Uh, it's not, that's not the same as TGA then? No, it's not a TGA, no. A trans and schema attack yeah, is, yeah, yeah, that is. It's a small stroke within yeah. the brain itself. Yeah. yeah, it's like a little tiny stroke. Yeah, it's a different thing, yeah. yeah. Um, they can appear to be um, a little bit like, um, you know, when you have the vacant, um, where you shake, sorry, my brain, I've got COVID brain. What, what's it called when you have the illness where you shake? Um, Parkinson's, you mean? Parkinson's is one of them, isn't it? Mm. Or, or um, oh, petty mouths, they used to call them. Those, yeah. Petty mouths. Um, yeah. Epilepsy. They, epilepsy, that's it. So you, yeah. you're going for yeah. a form of vacant rather than, than shaking oh. necessarily. It, it, it's, it's literally to do with either the heart or the brain. So if you've got a heart problem with your heart, obviously that's not feeding the brain the oxygen via the blood that it needs. And that's where, you know, an absence can occur in the brain and therefore in, in the mind of misperception. Um, or on the other hand, it can be the other way around, something like a mini stroke or something like that. It's difficult to tell. They, they, basically, the paramedics and other doctors can't tell them until they put you in a scanner and all the rest do, do all the tests. Yeah. Thank you. Liz, my sweetheart, 
Liz Barkley, I'd like to have um, you unmute yourself so you can talk about this. I'm sure everybody's fed up with hearing my voice, but um, is Liz still here? I don't think she is, is she? So what was the question? Can you hear it? Very same like me. She's obviously working with neuropathic. Hello. Oh, she is here. Liz, can you just say what it is about um, the neuropathic pain? Is she gone again? I don't know where Liz has gone. Oh, hang on. She's, I think she deleted herself. She's got um, cut off from the meeting, but I've readmitted her. Yeah. We'll just wait for Liz to kick back in again. Hello. Hi, Liz. Sorry. I've Hello. You. Would you like to talk about your pain, um, phantom pain? Yeah, just, just when you mentioned phantom limb pain there, my ears kind of pricked up a wee bit. So um, I specialise in pain um, <clears throat> up here in the cold northeast of Scotland. And um, phantom pain is such an interesting phenomenon. So we know that it's real because, you know, way back when it was very much looked at as a psychological issue. However, it was looked at as being a trauma response to the sudden loss of a limb. Um, <clears throat> however, we know now that the, the, the neuropathic element to it, so the neural pathways um, being severed as quickly as they are, whether that be a traumatic uh, loss of limb or an ischemic loss of limb or um, you know, planned surgical removal of a limb. Um, the nerve pathways become very confused very quickly and patients will still continue to complain of tingling sensations, shooting pains down to the sole of their foot or down to the tips of their fingers when in fact that limb is no longer there. Now there's been a lot of studies been done recently just to see how the brain actually is. Uh, actually processes that type of pain and it can be very difficult to retrain the brain um, what they tend to do is use a bit of uh, mirroring so we're trying to move away from all of these um, anti-neuropathic drugs they try to use physiotherapy mirroring and retraining the brain again they often use touch therapy too getting the patient themselves to touch around the site um, of the amputation uh, they sit with the physios, they look at it in the mirror, and it's getting the brain to realise exactly what is going on. Um, you will still get patients who, you know, 15, 20, 25 years down the line, post loss of limb, are still complaining of this shooting pain. And it is one of those things, we understand it a little bit, but it is still a little bit of an anomaly. Mm -hmm. um, sort of combat injuries as well can be particularly difficult to treat because that's usually a traumatic loss of limb and there is some thought being given now <clears throat> excuse me in certain fields um that nerves have a memory that you're speaking about sort of memory at a cellular level um basically these things don't forget what was there and will continue to relive the pain it's almost yeah. like a post-traumatic stress issue now mm -hmm. um it's just it's, it's absolutely fascinating I, I've, I've never given much thought to anything that's been discussed tonight and i've just i've really enjoyed it thank you very much thank you um i hope that I explained for everybody the um the situation with the mirroring just in case anybody didn't really understand that I mean I've dealt with it myself with patients but if you can imagine that this hand is missing and this one is the real one they would place a mirror here and they would do touch sensation so that you would rub it down oh I've got feedback you would have Is everybody getting feedback from me? Um, it's from Colin Grove, so I have now muted him. Oh my oh, God. Okay. 
So what I was saying is if you have, this is a missing hand and this is the hand that's still here, you would place the mirror so that it would face towards the missing limb and you would touch and stroke and create sensations here and the person would actually feel it where the missing limb would appear. Um, and it's a way of getting the neuropathic pathways to actually recognize that the limb isn't there because they'd look down and see that the, um, you know, the leg or the hand wasn't there. So um, mm -hmm. as Liz was talking about, you know, I completely agree that these neuropathic and idiopathic um, pains that are left behind is due to memories as well. It's it's fascinating stuff, isn't it, Liz? hundred percent yeah and it's it's amazing how different people have different responses to these things as well <clears throat> excuse me you'll know in your line of work as well when you're sitting with these patients going through all of these um treatments and uh you know there's their psychological help with it as well as the physiotherapy so you're trying to look at the sort of biopsychosocial elements of their pain mm. um, and you'll know yourself that some people will respond really well to treatment some people always want a chemical treatment and some people just have absolutely no luck with anything that they try and that pain just persists right up until the day they die sometimes. Um, in Obviously, um, in our jobs, what we understand in our training is that um, the neuropathic pathways aren't their set program for life, that they can create a new um, mm -hmm. link. So it's a bit like creating a new London Underground um, station from A to Z. So um, it wasn't there before, but you can add this bit in. Well, that's how it works with the neuropathic pathways. The only time that it doesn't work is if you've got something like multiple sclerosis and it's the myelin, which is a coating on the, um, the neuropathic lines and pathways. <laughs> and if the myelin's missing, you can't retrain the nerves to, to change. So that's the only time where this would be problematic if there was a multiple sclerosis patient at the same time. But anyway, moving on from muscle memory and stuff like that, um, from my explanation and from Liz's explanation, um, cellular memory in pigs, this is from Elwood, um, Edwards, um, the creatures outside looked from pig to man and from man to pig and pig to man again, but it was already impossible to say which was which. Um, I'm guessing that's a quote, Ed. Yes, Animal Farm. <laughs> I just uh, sort of saying earlier that um, something about whether or not uh, what uh, people's behaviour would be like if they'd had um, pig organs or transplants. Ah, okay. <laughs> so I just thought I'd just put that in a bit, being a little bit, bit, uh, bit amusing. Yeah. Was that from? Was that quoted by the Colonel? Um, no, that was quoted in as from Animal Farm. That's quoted by George Orwell. So. All right. It wasn't about a specific pig that had said it. No, no, no. It's the narrator in Georgia. It was um, Animal Farm. So, no, it was right at the end. I think it's the closing lines of Animal Farm. So, yeah. It's just not really anything to do with transplant, but I just thought it'd be amusing because people were talking about pigs <laughs> getting uh, human cells, uh, pig cells in human bodies. So, I just wanted, yeah, okay. Because you will actually, if you did have uh, pig heart valves, I guess you would be partially pig anyway, wouldn't you? So, <laughs> a new type yeah. of superhero. Yes, pig man. <laughs> pig man. There's supposed to be a pig man in Cannock Chase. That's another talk altogether, Rob, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm not the expert on that. <laughs> Maybe we can get Richard Freeman to do that one. Um, John Kane has said continued use of benzodiazepines can cause memory loss as well. Would that be a part time memory loss, John, or would that be a permanent one? Seems to be permanent. Um, I've, I've experienced it myself. I have, I suffer with post traumatic stress disorder and take benzos. And it seems to, my wife tells me I've done something, could be a few years ago, and I have no recollection of it at all. So, I looked it up and found out that continued use of benzodiazepines or tranquilizers can cause memory loss completely. Mm. I'm sorry to hear that. Don't forget, though, just on the um, 
just to you know look after your interests a little bit women do exaggerate slightly so did you really do that did you forget to put the bin out on tuesday we kind of exaggerate slightly anyway but I, i've never heard about the benzo pins being permanent yes and um metazolam which is used as a local anesthetic in small surgical operations can stop you remembering the procedure completely mm. that is another benzodiazepine so the kind of thing for that would be ketamine i guess would that come into that category i'm not sure about ketamine no i think that's an out of body one yeah yeah the, the, the ketamine will give you detachment from the current situation as opposed to loss of memory uh okay thank you for clarifying that um, moving down, Ian Rowley's put a link on here for a mirror box. Um, I'm guessing the mirror box would be um, to do with the mirror that Liz had mentioned. Ian, I don't know where you are now. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I would say it's a, some very strange things go on as well. It's not just about the uh, actually feeling tingling sensations from the missing limbs. From what I understand of uh, what uh, this guy said, it's almost like physical contortions, like uh, the, I think I remember one instance of an arm at, and the patient describing it as though it was twisted right round their back and that in, in some, you know, some really hideous contortions, but um, it's very strange, exactly. Um, but I think his idea was somehow it was almost linked to, because there's this homunculus areas in the brain, which kind of like typically associate with the areas of the body in terms of sensations and that. It may well be something like that, but it is certainly it, it is uh, it's a very interesting area uh, and we still don't know all the answers. Definitely not. Definitely not. Are you within the medical profession as well then? Uh, no, uh, but this chap, uh, the, the link I've actually put in there is to, he's actually a, um, he's actually a, a, a medical hypnotist, but he was originally a um, <laughs> A, a nurse uh, uh, and he knows all this stuff so uh, and so this is um, yeah this is stuff I picked up from uh, from another life and I was into that to neurolinguistic linguistic programming and stuff like that but mm. which is a bit, uh, bit dubious but uh, but yeah it is uh, there is a lot of science behind it and the memory box certainly seems to it seems to be quite successful for some people um, it's strange as well because Exactly as you say, you, you look in the mirror box and you see, effectively, you see the limb that you have got, but you see it in position the limb that doesn't. Now, somehow that seems to, it seems a bit counterintuitive, but somehow seeing, I, I suppose, what your nerves are telling you, somehow that can seem to actually act therapeutically and almost um, make the limbs start to get smaller and disappear. Um, as I say, I mean, there are some amazing um, uh, instances of people trying to describe what it's like as the therapy goes through. And some of them almost say it feels like the limbs withering away uh, and therefore it's less and that therefore there's less pain. So it's almost as if, as if the, the nerves or, or the brain is accepting the reality of the situation, but it takes time. Mm. It's very unusual. Perhaps creating the new pathways uh yes or, or possibly severing them I, I don't know it's <laughs> the brain is such a strange uh, strange organ and i think a lot of it um we don't understand a lot about it because i think ultimately um a lot of what we're aware of is is is, is emergent properties so it's to actually try and localize it although we can localize some things in the brain we can say well that part of the brain is for example is certainly uh, associated with with um, fixing a memory, it's not like we can say that part of the brain entirely is responsible for it. It seems to be lots of areas of the brain. So it's almost as if it's a, I guess the uh, analogy to use, it's almost like a, 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 an orchestra. Um, mm. And somehow, uh, if you take any of the individual parts, you haven't got the whole picture. It's yeah. only when the orchestra is playing that, as I say, that, <laughs> to try and use that as an analogy for science, science doesn't work quite work that way. So, so mm. that's a problem. But, um, but yeah, it's a very fascinating area. 
Um, Rob, that's the end of the questions that we have. Unless anybody else has, um, oh, we've got one from Delith come in very um, quickly. As a professional sales studier by day, um, that was a really enjoyable talk and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, if anybody has to say, you're very welcome to unmute yourself. Um, um, yeah, can we go back to this issue of cellular memory and a point that you mentioned, Caroline, about a cell has a memory of itself so it can reform. Mm. Let's just think about that for a minute. Are we saying the cell dies and it's replaced by a counterpoint? Now, if the cell that was there has got a memory of itself and it's, it dies, then its memory is gone as well. Yet the new cell has replaced it. So it implies that the memory of the cell is somewhere, but not in the dying cell. Um, maybe, and this is a little bit controversial, but maybe we should think about the spiritualist hypothesis whereby um, everybody has an etheric body as well as a physical body. And maybe the etheric counterpart of the cell is still there. And therefore the newly forming physical cell takes its recipe as it were from the etheric counterpart. How about that for a hypothesis? So would that be like great aunt Madge telling you the story that's been handed down through the family? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. The etheric, it's the um, overriding spiritual sense that would tell you yeah. the family. It's, um, it's, it's like, allegedly, we have two bodies, the physical and the etheric. And when you die, um, the, you go on living in your etheric body, at least for a time. So it's an exact counterpart to the physical body. Mm. But maybe, uh, I mean, just ballparking here, not seriously, but maybe you, everybody's got an individual DNA. Maybe that DNA is kind of the frequency or the, the, the equivalent of um, QR code that links to your, where your memories are somewhere else. And so that when somebody has a heart put in, with their DNA, that's still linking to their memories, wherever it is, um, whereas the rest of the body is think, you know, linking to the, um, the memories via the DNA uh, of the recipient. I don't know. But it, yeah. Um, on, on the subject of the organ transplants, I went to a trans demonstration of trans mediumship once where I asked the, when it got to the question answer session, I asked of the trans medium or the, or the spirit guide of them, when a transplant takes place, does it mean the spirit of the donor is now present within the sphere of the recipient? And that's why his memories and personality change. The answer I was given was no, but the aura around the transplanted heart or whatever it is, does transfer itself. We're not going to get a guaranteed answer, are we, unfortunately? Well, well no. Well, that's no. part of the fun, isn't it? We don't that know just... the answers ourselves, so it's a, it's a very interesting hypothesis, hypothesis definitely. Um, as yeah, it's just, just interesting to it's throw these hypotheses around. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, somebody had their hand up a minute ago. Who would that be? Should it? I don't know. Um, Liz. I think it might have been me, but I might have been a little bit confused because um, <laughs> just to, it doesn't come in with the obviously with transplanted organs, but uh, every cell in the body has basically the same DNA. Yeah. Uh, the clever bit about any cell in the body knowing what it's supposed to be doing is is its position in relation to, to the other cells and that effectively allows it if you like to turn on the dna uh codes which associate so for example if we're talking about the intestines yeah. there are certain dna molecules that are turned on effectively because it's in the test in the intestine area but effectively every cell in the body has a master blueprint to be any other cell in the body it's quite literally the location which dictates its function and what it does um, Otherwise, I think as somebody once said, 
Otherwise, before you know it, you'd end up growing a nose on the end of your foot or something like that. Mm. <laughs> but that obviously doesn't come into the transplanted organs. Although, of course, the interesting, I'd say two counts of that. The first one is, it might be interesting to know what a baseline is for somebody who's had a, a, an organ transplant. I mean, I would assume anybody who's had an organ transplant would normally have, might be assumed normally have some sort of interest in, in the recipient, you know, just out of gratitude or something like that. So possibly, um, I'm just saying as, as something which needs to be counted out is, is somehow that story is not affecting um, uh, what they express. Um, I think the second thing to consider is, is if these transplanted organs are bringing up new memories or new, actually probably more in terms of, of new uh, desires, new, um, what's what I'm looking for, uh, new urges. Mm. What's that doing to the to the urges, to the to the original urges? Unless, of course, what we're saying is that the, the, the original urges, the, what the person was like before, that was stored somehow that was being stored or, or however you may, may put it in the organ which was actually removed it's an interesting thing how does how do how do uh, for the body the new memories in, in, in some ways actually overcome the old body particularly when we're talking about habits and, and um, compunctions and um, and uh, preferences and things like that so in the, in the heart's code there's a, there is an example of uh, what do they call it? Um, where, where the like domino transplants. Um, I mean, I've got it here if you wanted me to read it to you. But in essence, there's a guy who uh, had the, his lungs were failing, um, and he had to have a heart and lung transplant, but his heart was fine, and so when he had heart and the, the new heart and lung his heart was given to another person who needed their heart replacing uh, and um, somehow that they they know each other um, but they they said that the person who received the, the heart from the other guy um, had taken on like personality traits from because it was something that was was quite marked, you know, in terms of the, the way that they behaved. Mm. So um, it, it's not just the memory; it, it also often it, in, entails the you know, character, you know, uh, temperament, and so on. Yeah, just taste and food and things like that. Um, uh, Ian, my um, late husband, he had a transplant from his sister and it was bone marrow when he had leukemia and he never had allergies before but after having her bone marrow he had an allergy to metal and could never wear metal again so there's a lot of things um that can be transferred over uh, did, did, did the donor did his sister suffer from that apparently so yeah uh, he, got her, he got her foul temper as well <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, just as an idea, then. I mean, coming back to if there's this evidence of of certain uh, certain things being passed by by transplants. I mean, I'm just wondering if, uh, and presumably it might have been done. If, if if there's any study been done onto what sort of things. So, for example, if we talk about somebody who's having a heart transplant, if we can predict what sort of what sort of but what sort of things might change? So I, I don't know. I mean, in, in certainly in the, I guess it, does, it doesn't yeah. happen with all of them. It's but it's as um, oh, they different which I've them. got that they do, so somewhere in the bowels of the papers uh, there is a statistic that says it that it's a certain proportion. And um, so I'll start trying to find it if I can. But it's, it's somewhere in there. So you, you carry on discussing things. I'll try and find it. Sure. Um, was there any more? Questions. Andrew, have you got any questions today? I think Christian's gone quiet. 
Uh, just um, got here. U US academics have developed a theory called cellular memory to explain personality changes. Uh, apparently, somebody documented 70 cases and argues that cellular memory affects at least 10% of all people who have a heart, lung, kidney, or liver transplant. So it's, it's not everybody, you know, it's not something that is going to happen, mm -hmm. definitely. But it's a, a not insignificant um, minority. Thank you for that. I mean, it's still quite a high percentage, really, isn't it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's got one here. A 29 year old lesbian fast food junkie who became a heterosexual vegetarian after being given the heart of a teenage girl. Um, Thank you very much indeed. Um, CJ, did you have any last questions? No, um, I'm going to have to head off in a moment, but I just wanted to say thank you for a fascinating talk. It's been a wonderful evening. I've really enjoyed listening to it. And uh, I'm afraid my knowledge of cellular biology is absolutely zero, so I cannot assist at all. I was the worst. I think I got the worst result ever in anatomy and physiology when I was a nurse. So there you go. Probably best not ask me anything ever, Rob. But thank you very much indeed. And are you coming along to the um, Rob? Are you going to be at Seriously Strange? No, I'm afraid that being a season tickets. A holder for Wolverhampton Wanderers, and it's a home game against Southampton, and it's my, <gasps> and it's my granddaughter's birthday of the day. Oh, after. that's a better reason, but yeah. Okay, <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed for a wonderful no talk. And in fact, although I'm off screen at the moment, I think I've still got on here somewhere. This is what we normally use for when you appear. Here you go. Well, I hope you win. Hey, hey. Oh, hey. <laughs> um, if you, that, that's where. And that's my stand. And if you go, oh, you, oh damn, it's missed. What's that? Oh, I was just going to say, if you go between the L and the V, that um, exit, the yeah. side of the entrance, and you go down about one, two, three, three or four rows, and then four or five in, that's where I sit. You have the same seat each time. Is that how it works? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll sit with two of my mates. <laughs> oh, fantastic. All right. Well, thank you very much for a great talk. And thanks for everyone. It's been yeah, a long enjoyed. time since we saw you. And looking forward to, um, it's been two hours, so I'm going to say goodnight to everyone. But looking forward to seeing you again, talking about the Aintree Spectres. In the oh, oh, yeah. okay. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Take care. Good night. God bless. See you all next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.